Now listen to this story from the Gospel according to Luke. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and he taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but we haven't caught a thing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they'd done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all of those who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you'll be catching people. When they brought their boats into the shore, they left everything and followed him. One morning I passed by a church and I noticed that there was only one word on the sign that sat out by the street. Maybe they hadn't finished the sentence they'd planned to put there or maybe they were taking a sentence down and left this one word, but for whatever the reason, the one word left on the sign was call. That was it, call. It started me thinking that I hadn't heard that word mentioned in a sermon in a long time. When I was growing up in the Baptist church, people would always talk about their call. And if they didn't have one already, well, they were all looking for what God was calling them to do. A call was something that certain people got that came directly from God. People in the Bible certainly got one. Moses did. And Isaiah. Certainly Jesus. And definitely the Apostle Paul. Having a call gave you a great story to tell. People would admire you. You became unique and special. It was a sign that God had something special for you to do. Unfortunately, if you didn't have a call like that, a call to special service, as we used to say, to be a pastor or a missionary, then you were tempted to think that God had overlooked you in some way that God didn't consider what you did as being special or important. And maybe for you some deep doubt or disappointment have set in. If that's how a community of faith is going to think about call, then perhaps it's a good thing we don't use that word anymore. If there's one thing we don't need, it's a word that's going to make some folks feel special and other people just ordinary in the eyes of God. Still, I would hate for us to give up on that word altogether just because a few people misunderstood or misused it. It's a good word and it can help us understand how the Spirit of God moves in all of our lives. One reason that I like this story from the Gospel of Luke is that it has helped me to think differently about what a call from God is. You recognize the central character in the story, don't you? It's Simon Peter. I like it when Simon Peter shows up in a story. You can always depend on him to say the things that you might say if you were in his shoes. That's why the story of Simon Peter's call to discipleship has a lot to say to us. It doesn't look like other call stories, does it? There's no burning bush like the story of Moses or no blinding light on the road to Damascus like for Paul. 
There's no distinct voice of God in a temple filled with incense like Isaiah. No, in this story, the call doesn't come as a summons, but as an invitation. And it comes to an ordinary man who's in the midst of his own struggle to make a living for himself and his family. So, Jesus is sitting in Simon Peter's boat after the crowds have gone. Jesus knows that Peter is exhausted from his own efforts at fishing all night. He knows that he's caught nothing. But even still, he turns to Peter and invites him to do something. Go out into the deep water, he says, and there let down your nets. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? But is it really? Do you know what Jesus is really asking here? He's asking Simon Peter to trust him. To trust him so much that Peter would be willing to leave this shallow place in his life and in his work and begin to explore the depths, to go to the limits of what he thinks is possible. Not only for him, but for those all around him. Go out into the deep water, says Jesus. Trust me and see what happens. Well, that must be why Peter is so reluctant to do it at first. He knows that once he takes the risk of leaving what is familiar and comfortable, the direction of his life might very well change. He knows that when he leaves the shallow places behind, shallow places in his work, shallow places in his relationship with others, to himself and to God, and dares to go just a little bit deeper in trust, things are going to be different for him and for anyone who's around him. Now, a good way to resist responding to God's call to enter the depths of your life is to say something like Simon said to Jesus. Oh, there's no use for me to go into those depths, Jesus. I have fished those waters already. I've tried to pray. I've tried to study. I've tried to become a servant like you, Jesus. I've tried to live out my faith in a way that would please you, Jesus. And I have come up empty every single time. I'm just tired. I'm tired of fishing those same waters. There is nothing out there in the depths for me. It's just another way of saying... I'm not good enough to do this. I'm not smart enough, Jesus. I'm not young enough. I'm not old enough. I'm not faithful enough. It's just best that you leave me alone. It's best that you give up on me like I've given up on myself. I am a sinful human being. I have tried everything that you've asked me to do. And it doesn't work. Right then is when Peter becomes a model for our discipleship. It happens in the moment when Peter responds to Jesus' call and says, But if you say so. And then off he goes, perhaps reluctantly, out into the deep water, and there he finds abundance like he has never imagined. Oh, it's not the kind of abundance that makes him rich. It's the kind of abundance that shows Peter how rich God's grace and love are and how much God wants to be in relationship with all of us. That's why I like this call story better than some others. Because... Jesus doesn't call Peter to be anything other than who he is. He doesn't call Peter to be a rabbi like him or even to a career in carpentry. Jesus calls Peter to live in the depths of his own life, not to try to live out Jesus' life. Peter remains at heart a fisherman who has a heart for Jesus and for the humanity that Jesus serves. 
This is not a call to a new career to be a professional Christian. It's a call into a deeper relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Thank you.